Bible, Psalm 9, a good uh, opportunity for us to, as we turn our attention more toward God. First two verses of that psalm. I will thank the Lord with all my heart. I will declare all your wonderful works. I will rejoice and boast about you. I will sing about your name most high. As I'm reading those, what sticks out to me is the choice that's being made. Did you notice four times it says, I will. I will do these things. I will thank the Lord. I will declare your wonderful works. I will rejoice. I will sing about your name. Sometimes we get caught up in thinking that worship to God and our relationship with God is all emotional and if we don't feel it. You know, then we, then, then, then we end up doing all sorts of wacky things. Let's start with this choice. That I will thank the Lord, declare his works, rejoice, and sing about it. Let's pray together. As we come before you this morning, Father, I'm reminded that I am not worthy of my own come before you. It is certainly not by anything that, that I have, nothing that I have done. It's nothing within me that makes me eligible to come before you. It is simply that gift of Christ, that finished work of Christ on the cross that we are even able to come before you, that we are able to come into your presence, and you tell us you want us in your presence. What a great reality to know that it's not dependent upon the, uh, upon the, the fleeting, the flimsy, and flopping emotions that I have, but it's based upon who you are, that our relationship with you is established. It's not because of of meeting any certain criteria, simply coming to you with an open heart, coming to you with that faith. I think of when the centurion came, and, and he, this one who was looked upon as, as a Gentile, one who was looked upon as one who didn't even know who God was, and he came before you and said, I am not worthy to have you come under my roof, but I'm going to say the word. Thank you for your word to us. Thank you for how it ministers to us. I thank you for the way in which you have given us a glimpse into your character, uh, some understanding. We're never going to plumb the depths of that, but Father, you continue to take us deeper and deeper, and I'm so grateful for that. I pray that you would help us to be people that respond to you, that when we open our life and you work, that we respond, that we don't remain silent, and that our spirit certainly is not downcast. Father, as we're here, though, we, we know there are some who are struggling. Some who are struggling physically. We want to lift them before you and ask that you would touch their bodies. Lord, some have been battling for a long time. Some have, uh, well, things that are thought of as chronic in this world. Uh, issues and challenges. But all of us have those distractions that come in and want to drag our attention away from them. But we want to come alongside our brothers and sisters who are battling uh, physically, spiritually, emotionally. And ask that you would touch their hearts and lives, that we would all be able to turn our attention a bit more to you. I ask that you would grant peace to us. You've told us about it, that you give us peace that passes all understanding. Sometimes our situation does not lend itself to peace, but you are a God of peace. Uh, sometimes the challenges that are before us can cause us to be upset, but you are a God of peace. I ask that you would minister your peace even now to the hearts and minds gathered here. That we would be able to release those things that would seek to keep us in bondage and distracted from you. And that we might be able to rele release them into your care. That we would be uh, people of the word that cast all our anxieties upon you. And when we find that they've flared up again, that once more again we would cast them upon you. Knowing that you care for us. You care for us. What great words. What great
great comfort, what a great gift. Father, we are people who need your cleansing. As you even even again this morning and just remind me of some of the ways in which I I don't reflect your grace, in which I don't reflect your character. I want to. Give us the strength and wisdom we need to not be in charge to let you be the one who leads, to follow your leading and guiding. Lord, sometimes I want to lash out. That doesn't come from you. It doesn't come from the, the God of all peace. It doesn't come from the one who speaks truth but yet does it in love. Help us to be those kinds of people. I ask that you would be with our missionaries. We're going to hear about some of them in a little bit. And what, what a what a great gift they have been to be able to be in places that we cannot be. Uh, you've gifted them in ways that enable them and help them to reach out in, in, in other ways and places. And I think some of the organizations with privilege come alongside them. You know, the rescue mission comes to mind. They're gearing up for, well, every night they have to gear up. Uh, but as Thanksgiving is coming and they do a tremendous ministry to our city, then I pray that you would guide that leadership there. We think of the Hope Center and thank you for the way in which they step in and speak the truth to those who are wondering and those who might be tempted to choose other than life for their child. And I pray that you would help them to make good connections. Think of child evangelism fellowship as they reach out and even during the school year, open doors that they might have places to meet, that they might have uh, children. Well, we know some children want to hear pray that you would raise up those who would be able to lead some of these groups that the children could hear about Christ. And that we would open our mouth. So we have neighbors and friends who don't know you. We have family members who don't know you. Those of us who do know you should be speaking and telling about you. Father, focus our attention as we sing songs, as we hear scriptures. <coughs> That what we sing would be not just an expression of clever lyrics. We never want it to be that. We want it to be an expression of our heart. A heart that is open and wanting to be transformed by the gracious power of God. Thank you, Father. You are not confined to these walls. Remind us of it, that in all we do, we will not only be aware of your presence, but channels of your blessing. Thank you for those who have blessed me. Thank you for these folks here, Father, and the way they have touched my life over and over again. And I know you are using them to touch other lives as well. Continue to make them a blessing, and that you would be honor and glory, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Well, thanks for coming. A couple of things I want to point out to you in the bulletin, just very quickly. We do have a fellowship time that we've been doing. This was the second week. Uh, and we're going to continue that next week if you uh, want to come and join in, 945 downstairs. Just about a half hour is all, all that it is. And this uh, snow out there is a good reminder for you where you see it says text alerts. If you want to sign up for the WBCL text alert system, we are a part of that. We have there. When you get on the website, um, you look for Northside Missionary Church and click on there and you'll get the text alerts. We will, in the next few weeks, have a couple of people set up in the lobby with laptops that can help you get set up. We cannot sign you up. You'll have to sign yourself up. That's the way the system works. There's some information there. If you have questions on it, uh, you can ask me and uh, I'll give you the help that I can. Also, next Sunday is when the shoe boxes are due for Operation Christmas Child. There are some that are out there already. We appreciate those of you who putting those together, bringing those in, and Scott and Dawn as they, um, as they give leadership to that and make sure that things, that, that those get turned in and to the places they need to be. So next Sunday is when that needs to get together. You can look at the other announcements in the bulletin and if you have questions on any of it, uh, feel free to ask. Jewel and is Linda still going to come, and Linda are going to come and tell us about some of our mission. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning.
to talk to you about Bill and Debbie Jones. Um, we talk about missionaries, and we always think of people going to foreign lands to um, work with others. Bill and Debbie Jones are actually liaisons with um, Missionary Church, with um, World Partners at Bethel University. And this is the first time I've used this one, so I'll try this. Hot dog works. <laughs> one of the things that I found in um, one of the newsletters from Bill Gates, he sends an email actually about every week. Um, for, to people who are praying for them. And what he said was discipleship is the effort both to be a disciple and to make other disciples. It's about the immense value of God at work and in one individual's life and the resulting impact on their lives. And I thought that was just a great description of what they're doing. They're working with students in colleges and other individuals, discipling them, mentoring them, coaching them, and helping them come to the Lord and uh, grow in the Lord. So highlights from the past year, uh, some of the things that they've done, they've continued their discipleship efforts at Bethel University, of course, that's their main, main uh, work. They have been holding weekly meetings also with students from IU South Bend, which is close by there. Um, they recently took a trip to Hawaii, a church there, and presented their, their Steps to Freedom, a Bondage Breaker series. And this is really interesting, and I think that um, enough people don't think about these things. There are a lot of things that we're held bondage to in our lives because of lies that we might believe, um, things that have happened to us in the past, and you know, people say, I'm not me because of how I was raised or whatever. But you know, this, what this work that they're doing is really helping people break free from those things and understand how there's freedom in Christ. Um, also, they've tried to fit in time with their family throughout the year, which uh, has been not as much as they wanted, of course. Uh, they do have prayer requests. They've asked that we continue to pray for the breaking free, uh, that Christ, those groups, that, that Christ would, expose the lives that people um, have been believing and help them um, either come to Christ or grow deeper in their relationship with Christ. Bill's had some health issues. He's asking that we continue to pray that the physicians can find out what those, what is the source of those and um, bring them to help. Um, also, these IU South Bend meetings. IU is not a Christian college, of course, and yet there are people there who are Christians, students, and um, they just pray that students would continue to be faithful and attend the sessions that they're holding. And then they also continue to work one-on-one, -on -one, holding uh, new discipleship with the Bethel students, with graduates even, and others in the community. And they're just praying for guidance from the Holy Spirit in those relationships as they work with people. And one last thing, Bill has um, noted that they're really seeing the, the Lord do transformational work and the people that they are serving in the lives of the groups, the people that they're working with. They've also sent some oppression from the enemy, which would be Satan from his attacks. And he's just asking us that we pray both for the, for the protection of Bill and Debbie and for the people that they're working with. And he shared some of those experiences in those um, emails with us where um, it's very obvious that there has been an attack on someone and how they have prayed and, and worked through that. But he also prayed that they would continue to submit to God, resist the devil, and that they would stand strong in the full armor of God. serving the Lord in um, with Whitworth in Ionia, Michigan. And they moved there from North Carolina uh, a year ago, May, May of 2020. Uh, Lyle works with MSI and oversees the safety program at the School of Missionary Aviation Technology, which is there at Ionia. And this is one of MSI's uh, training centers, training schools. Um, there he helps to train and prepare new missionary pilots and mechanics. And another part of Lyle's position is to travel to do safety audits and safety training wherever he's needed. Unfortunately, due to COVID, the traveling was stopped for 15 months. And so finally, starting uh, this past June, uh, they were able to travel to Lynchburg, Virginia, to Oshkosh, Oshkosh, Wisconsin, and all over uh, Missouri to lead safety audits during the past five months. So they're really thankful to be able to have travel opened up again so that they can uh, go around to do those things. Um, the whole purpose, let's do this one. Okay. The whole purpose. 
purpose of missionary aviation is to get the good news of Jesus Christ to areas that are difficult to get to. They transport missionaries and, and supplies to these areas so that these people groups can be reached with the gospel and that the Bible can be translated into their language. Recently, the Gizra Bible was dedicated in Papua New Guinea, and this was especially meaningful to the Rifis uh, because Lyle flew many times to that part of uh, Papua New Guinea to um, support the translation work there. And now the Lord is using him to train new missionary pilots and mechanics to continue on with that type of work. Uh, before I close, I would like to share just a little bit about their home. I don't know if you remember from last year, when they first went to Michigan, they lived in this motor home for um, a number of months until um, while they were looking for a house. And finally, the Lord did um, bless them by providing this house for them to purchase uh, last September, a year ago, this past September. So they're very grateful for that. So uh, some things to pray about, just for safety, as Lyle and sometimes Becky travels to do the audits. And uh, pray for Lyle as he helps to train and prepare the new pilots and mechanics um, at the school there. And also pray for Becky as she helps to lead LIFT, which is a women's, women's group there at the school. So um, there's more information and pictures down on the uh, hold to board at the base of the stairs there. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I'm going to be reading from Psalm chapter 2. And um, in your review Bible, that's on page 485. Why do the nations rebel and the people plot in vain? The kings of the earth take their stand, and the rulers conspire together against the Lord and his anointed one. Let us tear off their chains and free ourselves from their restraints. The one enthroned in heaven laughs. The Lord ridicules them. Then he speaks to them in his anger and terrifies them in his wrath. I have consecrated my king on Zion, my holy mountain. I will declare the Lord's decree, he said to me. You are my son. Today I have become your father. Ask of me, and I will make the nations your inheritance, and the ends of the earth your possession. You will break them with a rod of iron. You will shatter them like pottery. So now, kings, be wise. Receive instruction, you judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with reverential awe, and rejoice with trembling. Pay homage to the Son or he will be angry, and you will perish in your rebellion. For his anger may ignite at any moment. All those who take refuge in him are happy. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, join me in reading Matthew 22, uh, 1 through 14, which is found on page 908 in the Pew Bible. <clears throat> Once more, Jesus spoke to them in parables. <clears throat> the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding banquet for his son. He sent out his slaves to summon those invited to the banquet, but they didn't want to come. Again, he sent out other slaves and said, tell those who are invited, look, I've prepared my dinner. My oxen and fattened cattle have been slaughtered, and everything is ready. Come to the wedding banquet. But they paid no attention and went away, one to his own farm and another to his business. And the others seized his slaves, treated them outrageously, and killed them. The king was enraged, so he sent out his troops, destroyed those murderers, and burned down their city. Then he told his slaves, the banquet is ready, but those who were invited were not worthy. Therefore, go to where the roads exit the city and invite everyone you find to the banquet. So those slaves went out on the roads and gathered everyone they found, both evil and good. The wedding banquet was filled with guests. 
But when the king came in to view his, the guests, he saw a man there who was not dressed for a wedding. So he said to him, friend, how did you get in here without wedding clothes? The man was speechless. Then the king told the attendants, tie him up, hand and foot, and throw him into the outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are invited, but few are chosen.
by supposed to be up here for a minute, and then I'm going to me. The outbreak is a response to a good and gracious king. Not adding to him, not, not, not giving him uh, something uh, as, as a bribe or even as a payment, but simply a response to a good and gracious king. As the ushers come forward to receive our gifts and offerings. Father, we do want you to receive the glory, the greater glory. We don't, we're not trying to draw attention to ourselves, but to help people to see you and know you. Use this offering that others might come to see you, that others might come to know you, that others might come to uh, worship you, to give their lives to you. Again, we ask that you come alongside those organizations and groups that were able to stand with partially uh, and help them to proclaim the gospel of Christ. And that we in our homes and in the places we work, uh, what we retain, that we will use those to help those folks also know Christ, our good and gracious King, in whose name we pray. Um, let's pray together. Lord Jesus, your grace has paid it all, um, and we are grateful. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left an awful debt, but you washed it white as snow. We thank you so much um, for what you have done for us. And we have gathered together today to worship, to sing your praises, to hear from you. And now we come to that part of our worship where we attend to your word. And may we so attend. I ask, uh, Holy Spirit, that you would clear away any distractions because uh, we want to hear your word. So help us to focus. We ask that you would use it to minister to us and eventually to minister through us. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 
Jesus is coming back. He's coming back. It's called the second coming or the return of Christ. It's talked about all throughout the New Testament, starting with Jesus himself uh, in his teachings about it in the gospel. And it's the subject of our text today, which is on the other end of the New Testament from the gospels in the book of Revelation. So let me invite you to take your Bibles, if you will, and turn to Revelation chapter 19. Revelation 19.6, if you're using a pew Bible, it's on page uh, 1139, page 1139. Jesus is coming back to do a number of things. A number of things will happen at the return of Christ. Um, let me just share with you a couple of those things. Two of those things include that he will gather his people and that he will judge those who refuse him. And gather his people and judge those who refuse them. And Revelation 19 talks about both of these and presents these in two different pictures. A wedding and a war. A wedding and a war. Now, Jesus is pictured in this chapter first as a bridegroom at his wedding and then as a warrior king um, come to conquer. So we're going to take a look at these two pictures of the second coming of Jesus Christ. Um, the first one is the wedding feast of the Lamb. The wedding feast of the Lamb, or some of you uh, may have heard of it referred to more traditionally as the marriage supper of the Lamb means the same thing. The wedding feast of the Lamb. Look at, if you will, at verses 6 through 8. Then I heard something like the voice, you know, this is the Apostle John writing, um, He's uh, received a number of visions. He's been transported to heaven to see many things, and he reports on what he continues to see in here. Verse 6, Then I heard something like the voice of a vast multitude, like the sound of cascading waters and like the rumbling of loud thunder, saying, Hallelujah, because our Lord God the Almighty has begun to reign. Let us be glad, rejoice, and give him glory, because the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his wife has prepared herself. She was given fine linen to wear, bright and pure, for the fine linen represents the righteous acts of the saints. So let me just say at the outset as we get started in this passage that uh, I am not going to be able to comment on all the details and all the verses that we're going to read. Um, there's just not enough time to do that. So if I, if I appear to be skipping over certain parts, it's for the sake of time. Um, but I'm focus let, let's just focus in here especially on the return of Christ. And first of all, we'll look at we, the bride of the Lamb. We, the bride of the Lamb. In his visions from the Lord, the Apostle John, the author of Revelation, hears this vast multitude praising God because it's time for the marriage of the Lamb. Now, God's relationship throughout the Bible is often pictured as a man with his wife. Um, there is this kind of marriage symbolism, for instance, in the prophets, it's in the Gospels. Uh, Sheila uh, read for us from Matthew 22 earlier. Jesus used the parable uh, of, a, of a marriage feast, and it's also in Paul's Apostles. And great joy is expressed here in verse 7 in chapter 19 over the marriage of the Lamb. Now, a couple questions. Who is the Lamb? Who is the Lamb? Jesus, right, yeah. Very good. It's Jesus. The Lamb is Jesus. He's often referred to throughout the book of Revelation as the Lamb, mainly representing the fact, especially, that his, uh, representing his sacrificial death for our sins. You know in the Old Testament that often lambs were sacrificed for sins, and Jesus is that um, ultimate lamb who died for our sins. So then the question is, who is the bride? Who is his wife? It's the church. It's the church. It, it's us. It's the people of God. The closeness that Jesus desires to have and does have with those who follow him is pictured by what should be one of the closest relationships on earth, that of a relationship between a husband and a wife. And we see in this, in this passage that the church is a bride who is beautifully adorned. She's beautifully clothed. Ephesians 5 explains how the church gets to be so beautiful, how the people of God get to be so beautiful, where it says, Husbands, the Apostle Paul writes, Husbands, love your wives. How? Just as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her to make her holy, cleansing her with the washing of water by the word. He did this to present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or anything like that, but holy and blameless. 
Jesus, the groom, is the one who makes the church, the bride, so beautiful. And he did so by his death. He gave himself up for her so that she might be presented in splendor. It's no wonder that at this wedding, Jesus is referred to not so much as the bridegroom, but as the lamb. He's referred to as the lamb um, because it is in his capacity, in his function as a lamb, that he made the church, that he is making the church to be a beautiful, spotless bride for himself. Perhaps you've heard it asserted that the church is dying, that the church is dying, not Northside, but, you know, the church as a whole, that it's dying out. I just heard it again the other day, someone asserting that the, declaring that the church is dying. And I want to say to you that that's impossible. It's impossible. The church won't die. It can't die. Jesus died for it. It is his bride. Um, the church, it may look like the church is on the ropes, uh, but that's misjudging it. That's not seeing what's really going on. The church isn't yet perfect. We know that. But it's alive and well, and the Spirit of God is at work in it. Jesus died for the church, and the effects of the cross continue to transform it until one day, at this day that's talked about here in Revelation 19, the church will be presented to Christ as radiant and splendid and perfect in holiness without spot or wrinkle. And then verse 8 says that the fine linen of the bride is the righteous acts of the saints. Our faith, lived out in good works, lived out in righteous acts, also adorns the church. Now, this would be impossible apart from the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. For none of our works before salvation please God. But once a person is saved, then his or her righteous conduct, his or her good works can delight the heart of God. So we see that we are the bride of Christ. But then, number two, we are also the guests. We, the guests at the Lamb's wedding feast, is what verses 9 through 10 talk about. Verse 9, then he said to me, write those invited, and this is, by the way, this is an angel speaking to the Apostle John at this point. He says to him, write, those invited to the marriage feast of the land are fortunate. Um, and I think that's an unfortunate translation right there. The word is blessed. The word in most translations is blessed, not fortunate. Um, those invited to the marriage feast of the Lamb are blessed. He also said to me, these words of God are true. Then I fell at his feet. He, John falls at the feet of the angel to worship him. But the angel said to me, don't do don't do that. I am a fellow slave with you and your brothers who have the testimony about Jesus. Worship God because the testimony about Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. So who are those who are invited to the wedding feast? It's believers. Um, it's true Christians. It's, it's you and me who have put our faith in Jesus Christ who have been born again. Those, um, yeah, who have been born again. And you might be thinking, well, you know, I thought we were the bride. How can we also be the guests if we're, if we're the bride and we're the guests? Well, you know, in the, Revel in the book of Revelation, the pictures and the metaphors shift sometimes rather rapidly in order to make various points. In verses 7 to 8, the church is pictured as a bride. In verse 9, the church is pictured as the wedding guests. But what is the point of verse 9? The point of verse 9 is that we are blessed as believers. We are blessed. If you are a follower of Jesus Christ, you are blessed because when he returns, you will be gathered to his wedding banquet. He has, he has invited you into his everlasting joy. Now keep in mind that in the book of Revelation, prior to this, the book of Revelation is very clear that believers and Christians will many times, will often, many of them will suffer persecution, will endure tribulation. For instance, in Revelation chapter 2, verse 10, Jesus says, Don't be afraid of what you are about to suffer. Look, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison to test you, and you will, you will have affliction for ten days. Be faithful even unto death, and then I will give you the crown of life. And yet these very same people are the ones who are invited to the marriage uh, feast of the Lamb, and they are blessed. No matter what their circumstances are today, they are blessed because of what their eternity looks like. If you are a born-again Christian, you have been invited to the marriage feast of the Lamb, and you are blessed no matter what your earthly circumstances are right now, because this is all temporary. And notice what is said at the end of verse 9. These words of God are true. These words of God are true. Now, I want to ask you, what words of God aren't true? Right? It seems kind of pointless to state that, but he states that, the angel states that right here at this point, 
because he wants to punch home the truth of the fact that you are blessed if you are a believer because you have been invited to the marriage feast of the Lamb regardless of how bad your situation might be right now in this earthly life. Bad health, bad debt, bad loneliness, bad relationships, bad job. If you are a believer, you are still blessed. Your family not talking to you because of your faith, you're still blessed. Your friends dropping you because of your Christian profession, you're still blessed. You're feeling increasingly disenfranchised and out of sync with the trends and the thinking of the culture around you, you are still blessed. People in your life trying to do everything they can to curse you, you are still blessed. I was just reading this week about the people of Israel um, in, uh, near Moab, and uh, the king of Moab calls for this prophet, this seer, to come and put a curse on the people of Israel. <laughs> And this prophet's name is Balaam, and he comes, and, um, and the Lord won't let him curse Israel. He goes four times, and instead of a curse, he brings a blessing upon God's people, and the king of Moab just throws it head, hands up in despair. The Lord is determined to bless his people. The Lord is determined to bless his people, no matter what their circumstances are now. When you put your faith in Jesus Christ, in your gift of salvation was tucked this invitation, this invitation to the wedding ceremony of the Lamb that you might enter into his joy forever. This first picture of the second coming of Jesus is the picture of blessing for all those who are in Christ. We are destined for a grand celebration, the marriage feast of the Lamb, the uniting of the church with Jesus, the Son of God. Brides and grooms look forward to their, to their wedding with great anticipation and joy. What does this picture of the Lamb's wedding feast convey to us? That as believers, your future is an excellent one. Your future is a bright one. Life may not be great now, but it will be. Life may not be certain now, but there's nothing uncertain about the future when Christ comes back. Eternity starts off with a wedding between the people of God and their Savior. Thus will begin a closeness and an intimacy and happiness that will continue for eternity and will never tarnish or dim or lose its luster. So that's the first picture, the wedding feast of the Lamb. The second picture of the return of Christ is the warfare of the king. The warfare of the king. And we're still talking about Jesus, and we're still talking about his second coming. Number one, verses 11 to 16, talk about the returning king. The returning king. Verse 11, Then I saw heaven opened, and there was a white horse. Its rider is called Faithful and True, and he judges and makes war in righteousness. His eyes were like a fiery flame, and many crowns were on his head. He had a name written that no one knows except himself. He wore a robe stained with blood, and his name is the Word of God. The armies that were in heaven followed him on white horses, wearing pure white linen. A sharp sword came from his mouth, so that he might strike the nations with it. He will shepherd them with an iron scepter. He will also trample the winepress of the fierce anger of God the Almighty. And he has a name written on his robe and on his thigh, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. All this description about Jesus, each phrase, each, uh, yeah, each of the phrases and clauses intends to communicate something about the returning king, about Jesus. So John, the author, sees heaven opened, and he sees a rider on a white horse, and the rider is Jesus, and it's his second coming. And what follows in verses 11 to 16 is a, is a description of our Savior. So let's just walk through these phrases and briefly unpack them. Um, first of all, he is called faithful and true. And that's the first name or title that he's given in this passage. In fact, he'll be given four names or titles throughout this passage. But he's called faithful and true. Who doesn't want this in a leader? Who doesn't want this in a king or in a president? Someone who is faithful and true. How often do we get this in a leader? There is no deception about Jesus Christ. He does not lie or misspeak. He does not betray confidences. And then it says he judges and makes war in righteousness. He judges and makes war in righteousness. One writer explains that there is no vindictiveness or lust for conquest about him. All of his warfare, all of his judging is just. It is righteous. That he judges matters a great deal to those who are sore oppressed by injustice. That he makes war matters a great deal to those who need to be rescued from persecution and oppression and are looking for a champion to rescue them. And then it says his eyes were like a fiery flame. 
He sees everything. He knows everything. Everything that is done in public, everything that is done in secret, he knows it all. No enemy of Christ will be able to talk his way out of their wickedness. Proverbs 15.3 says that the eyes of the Lord are everywhere, keeping watch on the wicked and the good. And then it says that many crowns were on his head. Many crowns were on his head. He has absolute authority. James Hamilton writes, There is no dominion, no region, no locality over which he does not reign. And then we come to a second name. He had a, and we don't know what it is. He had a name known only to himself. There are things about Jesus that we will never know. Why is that? It's because he's divine. He's deity. He's the Son of God. He is infinite. However wonderful and majestic and glorious you might think Jesus is, he is more. He is more than what you think of him. And even for all eternity, we will not be able to unpack all the glories of Jesus Christ because he is infinite and we are finite. And then it says he wore a robe stained in blood. Whose blood? I'm not sure if this blood refers to his own blood or the blood of his enemies. This, this passage is reminiscent of a powerful passage in Isaiah 63 where there's this uh, picture of God um, trampling the wine press uh, of his enemies and the, his, his, his garments are spattered with blood. But often when we talk about Jesus and blood, the blood we're talking about is Jesus' own blood. Um, in the New Testament, it is the shed blood of Jesus that has changed everything. He not only rescues sinners by his shed blood, but he even conquers by his blood. For instance, Colossians 2.15. And in this picture before us, the battle hasn't taken place yet, but we see this king coming and his garments are spattered with blood. And some, some people suggest that maybe both are met in this passage. I'm quoting James Hamilton again. He says, he says this, If you trust in Jesus, his blood is shed for you. If you rebel against him, refusing to have him as Lord and obey him as king, your blood will be shed for him. We come then to his third name. His name is the Word of God, we're told. His name is the Word of God, one of Jesus' more well-known titles. He is the very Word of God. He is the very self-expression of the triune God. And we know that the Word of God is powerful. The speech of God is powerful. Remember how God created in the beginning, uh, on the third, uh, what did he say? I don't remember what, but he spoke it, right? <laughs> let there be light. <laughs> That's what he said. And God said, let there be light. It helps to know the Bible. Uh, God said, he spoke the heavens into being. That's the point. John 1 famously begins, in the beginning was the word and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, talking about Jesus. Um, verse 14, he is followed by armies in white. This is one of the parts that I'm just choosing to skip over. Verse 15, a sharp sword came from his mouth. A sharp sword came from his mouth, representing the power of his own Word, the power of Jesus' Word to conquer. Jesus is the Word, and his own speech is powerful. And we saw, that even, we saw that even in the Gospels in his earthly life. In Matthew chapter 7, the crowds were astonished at his teaching because he taught them as no one had taught them before, as one with authority. In John chapter 7, the Jewish guards reported about Jesus, never has anyone spoken like this man. At the tomb of Lazarus, Jesus cries out, Lazarus, come out. Lazarus come out, and Lazarus was raised from the dead. And some have suggested that Jesus had to say, Lazarus, come out. Because if he had just said, come out, then all the graves would have emptied at that point. So powerful is his word. John 5.25 says, I assure you an hour is coming and is now here when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. Then there's a lengthy description in verse 15. He will, he will strike the nations. He will shepherd with an iron scepter. He will trample the winepress of the fierce anger of God. These three actions in verse 15 all indicate that when Jesus returns, he will thoroughly judge the nations with complete righteousness and with complete justice. And then verse 16, we come to his fourth name or title. His name is King of Kings and Lord of Lords. In other words, he is the supreme, he's the supreme ruler. 
So here's the picture. Here's the second picture of the return of Christ, a mighty king. He came the first time in humility. He'll come the second time in glory. He came the first time as a gentle baby. He'll come the second time as a conquering king. He'll come with titles and authority and power. He'll come to judge the nations. So that's the returning king. Then verses 17 to 18 talk about an unpleasant invitation. An unpleasant invitation. Then I saw an angel standing on the sun, and he cried out in a loud voice, saying to all the birds flying overhead, Come, gather together for the great supper of God, so that you may eat the flesh of kings, the flesh of commanders, the flesh of mighty men, the flesh of horses and of their riders, and the flesh of everyone, both free and small, not both, I'm sorry, both free and slave, small and great. So an angel calls for all the scavenger birds to gather for a great feast. Jesus' victory over his enemies is assured. It is certain. And so the angel already invite, has already invited all, the, uh, scav- all these scavenger birds. And notice what the birds will feast on. It's the flesh of the dead. And who are these dead? Slaves all the way up through kings. Slaves through kings. There is no one left out. The flesh of all who oppose the Lord, regardless of status or rank or significance, from the kings who oppose Christ all the way down to the lowliest of servants who also oppose Christ. None will be too powerful for him to overcome, and none will be too insignificant for him to overlook. The gift of salvation is available to all people of every rank and status and tribe and nation. And the judgment is for all people of every rank and status and tribe and nation who refuse the gift of salvation that has been so graciously and freely offered to them. And then we come finally to number three, a lopsided battle. A lopsided battle. The battle is described, sort of, in verses 19 through 21. Then I saw the beasts, the kings of the earth, and their armies gathered together to wage war against the rider on the horse and against his army. But the beast was taken prisoner, and along with him the false prophet who had performed the signs in his presence. He deceived those who accepted the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image with these signs. Both of them were thrown alive into the lake of fire that burns with sulfur. The rest were killed with the sword that came from the mouth of the rider on the horse, and all the birds were filled with their flesh. In verse 19, the enemies of Christ gather for war. The beast, the kings of the earth under him, and all, and, 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 and all their allies. But the battle is over in, in two verses. The battle is over in two verses. In verse 20, the description moves from, the, from before the battle to the overthrow of the beast and the false prophet, the leaders, if you will. Um, and the beast and the false prophet are earlier described in the, in the book of Revelation. They are the uh, servants of Satan. Um, they, they, along with Satan, sort of form a, an unholy trinity. And these two are thrown into the lake of fire. Satan will join them in another chapter, in chapter 20, in the lake of fire. And then in verse uh, 21, the rest of the forces of evil are easily dispatched at the beginning of the verse there. So where is the lengthy description of this ultimate battle? It could be that the lack of description of the battle means that they're it's nothing to describe. <laughs> that there's nothing to describe. That it's that the battle is over, almost before it's begun. The devil is no match for Jesus. The devil is no match for Jesus, and the followers of the devil are certainly no match for Jesus. No matter how much they combine their strength together, Jesus is so powerful that he conquers by, by the word of his mouth. He conquers by the word of his mouth. He pronounces judgment. And as soon as he speaks, it's carried out. It's carried out. I think of Matthew chapter 8, verse 16. When Jesus here in his earthly life, it says, Now when evening came, they brought to him many who were demon-possessed, and he cast out the spirits with a, with a word. <laughs> they brought to him all those who were demon-possessed, and he cast out the spirits with a word. The armies of the Lord Jesus in this final battle appear to be there simply as witnesses of what take place because Jesus has this all wrapped up. And then the chapter closes with the birds of prey having been gathered, they begin their feast and none of them go hungry. They are all filled to the full. So that's the passage. I want to 
I want to ref- um, just reflect on some, some implications, if you will, some implications regarding um, the second coming of Jesus Christ. Its significance, for instance. Revelation 19 presents us with vivid images of the second coming of Christ and of its significance for all humanity. And the second coming does have significance for all humanity. For every human who has ever lived. So for you as well. Because the second coming ushers in the eternal age. It's the hinge between this age and eternity. If you ignore Jesus and choose to go your own way, when Jesus comes back, it's not like you can keep on going your own way and pretend like Jesus isn't there. It'll, his return will change everything. The second coming is significant for every man, woman, and child because it's then that the great judgment will take place. And it's when the great separation takes place, when those who are trusting in Christ will go into eternal life, while those who are ignoring and rejecting Christ will go into eternal punishment and misery. We talk about its justice, the implications of the second coming for justice. Let me ask you, are, are you exasperated by injustice in our world? Are you exasperated by injustice? Do you shake your head and weep at the many ways that evil seems to triumph in our world? Are you discouraged by the fact that what Mark Twain says seems to be true? A lie can travel halfway around the world while the truth is still putting on its shoes. <laughs> Are you frustrated that many good people are treated poorly while many troublemakers and wrongdoers seem to thrive? Well, let Revelation 19 encourage you that Jesus is going to bring about justice. We live in a mixed bag sort of world where sometimes the wicked prosper and sometimes the righteous don't. Um, But the time is coming, the end of the age is coming when everything will be taken care of. Justice is coming and the one who judges Judges with righteousness. And we can talk about the relevance of the second coming. In talking about the second coming of Jesus, do we have our head in the sand? Do we have our heads in the sand by talking about this second coming? In preaching about Re- preaching Revelation 19, do I have my head in the sand? Are we talking about things that don't matter? Are we spending, times on things, spending time on things that don't matter? I don't think so. Jesus is coming back. We will all stand before the throne of Christ at the final judgment. And I think to ignore that and not be prepared for that, that is to have your head in the sand. That's to have your head in the sand. Imagine a student who doesn't prepare for their final test that is worth half their grade. It's two weeks out, and they're not preparing for their test. Well, it's two weeks out, you know. Then it's one week out, and they're still not preparing for their final exam that's worth half their grade. Uh, well, you know, I've got to live my life now. You know, why worry about that? That's a week away. I've got to live my life now. Then it's, you know, 72 hours out. Well, my friends, I'm going to hang out with my friends tonight, you know. Then it's 24 hours out, you know, 24 hours away. I need my rest. I need my sleep in order to be prepared for that test. Imagine that. For some of you, that's probably not imagination. That's probably memory, right? That's, is that right? Memory for you? But it's foolish, right? It's foolish. And it's those who ignore Christ and the fact that he's coming back who have their head in the sand and who are acting foolishly as well. The teaching of these truths in Scripture, and and again, the second coming is talked about and the judgment is talked about all the way through the New Testament. Why is it talked about so often? To wake you up to reality. To wake you up to the truth of the final judgment. To wake you up to the reality that Christ is coming back and there will be a sifting that takes place when he comes back. He's coming to gather his people for blessing, but he's also to come to judge those who have rejected his offer of the gospel. Don't allow the urgencies of the moment distract you from the truly urgent matter, the matter of where you stand with Christ. And then let's consider the warning. There are two feasts that are mentioned in this passage you picked up on that, the marriage feast of the Lamb and also that great gruesome feast for the birds. And everyone in this room will be at one of those feasts. Everyone will be at one of those feasts. All of you who have thrown your lot in with Christ will be at his marriage feast. You are one of those blessed ones who have received your invitation by virtue of your faith in him. And all of you who do not have a relationship with Christ, who do not believe on him, will be at the other feasts. That is where all those who have rejected and ignored Christ will be. 
And this passage is written for you believers, but it's also written for you, those of you who have not put your faith in Jesus Christ. It's written to you, not to gloat, not to gloat, but to warn you so that you will throw your lot in with Christ, so that you will believe on Jesus, so that you will receive the gift of salvation, so that your reservation will be changed from the carnage feast to the marriage feast of the Lamb, where the guests will thrive and rejoice forever. And all throughout the Bible, God's word implores you to turn to the Lord. Whoa. That's not what I wanted. I guess I didn't put these up, but listen to, the, listen to these words from the Lord. Turn to me and be saved, all the ends of the earth, for I am God and there is no other. In another place, therefore repent and turn back so that your sins may be wiped out, that seasons of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. In another place, seek the Lord while he may be found. Call to him while he is near. Let the wicked one abandon his way and the sinful one his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord so that God may have compassion on him. May he return to our God for he will freely forgive him. Leo Tolstoy wrote the book uh, War and Peace. In that story, a lovely girl named Natasha is betrothed to a noble and upright man, a prince, Prince Andrei Bolkonsky. Sure, that's right. Um, because she is young, the marriage is delayed for one year. Uh, a year later, Prince Andre returns for the wedding. Natasha has waited faithfully for one year, but on the last night before the wedding, she is wooed by a worthless charmer um, who is already married, and she is very tempted. And the reader who is reading this <laughs> is saying, No! <laughs> Don't be tempted. It's the night before your wedding. You're, this guy you're getting is a great guy. Don't be tempted by this fool. It'll end in disaster. Believers, Revelation 19 is the Spirit of God calling out to you the same thing, to hold fast. The time is short. You will soon see Jesus. Don't be swayed by the world. The world is a worthless charmer. We, we read about Demas, who was with uh, Paul, one of Paul's ministry associates, who, for love of the world, left. Left. Who, for love of the world, left. Don't be swirled, swayed by the world around you. You know, when I hear of someone who has turned away from their profession of faith, I think, what if they, don't they realize what they have given up? Don't they realize what they have turned away from? They don't see it that way, but that's the reality. Revelation 19 shows us the reality. Those who turn away from the Lord are choosing to be fought against by Jesus the warrior king rather than embraced by Jesus the lamb. They're choosing to be at the feast of the birds than at the marriage feast of the lamb. They're choosing destruction over eternal life. They're choosing temporary pleasure and joy followed by eternal misery rather than temporary discomfort now followed by eternal fullness of joy. No matter how attractive the world gets, no matter how difficult the hardships of being a Christian gets, hold fast to Christ. He is coming back. And if he doesn't come back in your lifetime, you will see him at the end of your lifetime when you die. And just as a reminder, you know, funerals don't come on our schedule. Um, we don't know how long we have to live. And there is a deadline. A couple years ago, I memorized uh, Romans 225, it's a short verse, it's the, and these are the words of Jesus, only hold fast what you have until I come. Only hold fast what you have until I come. Jesus is coming back, he's coming back, and if you are a Christian, you are so richly blessed. And if you're not a Christian, you can be so richly blessed by putting your trust in him and by following him. Let's go to the Lord in prayer, shall we? Father, we thank you for your word, we thank you for the continual teaching about things that have not happened yet, but that are, have great significance for our future and things that we should be preparing for. We have events in our own lives that uh, may be a ways out, but that we know that we have to prepare for. And none are more urgent, and none are most significant, more significant than the reality that one day we will stand before you. So it is my prayer that everyone in this room will be prepared for that time when they stand before you. So work, Holy Spirit, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.
we're going to sing a response to the Lord um, before we, as a conclusion to our worship. So if you'll stand. there's um, anything you would like prayer for, maybe it's regarding what we've just seen in scripture, or maybe it's something else that you're going through unrelated to what we've just talked about. Uh, I'm trying to, Chelsea is one of our, is Chelsea here? And Peter is not here as well, so um, Sheila? Okay. And Andy, okay, great. Sheila's one of our deaconesses, Andy's one of our deacons, and they'll be up here, and they would be uh, happy to pray with you about whatever's going on. Will you bow your head for the benediction? May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all and all of God's people said, Amen. Amen.